three, two, one. Happy New Year! No, I'm just kidding. But it is midnight Eastern, and that means the deadline has come and gone, and we can finally record a show. For the second straight year, the reigning National Player of the Year is coming back. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? Welcome in to the Locked on College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. I'm your host today, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for making us your first listen or watch every single day. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the official sports book of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. I wasn't joking off the top, by the way. Yes, I really did stay up till midnight Eastern time to record this episode for you because I wanted to make sure we had all the most up-to-date news we could have about players either staying in or pulling out of the NBA draft. Now, as you well know, if you're here and you're a college basketball junkie, you know the sheer amount of decisions that were coming out and being made on Wednesday. And so there's no way we're going to try and cover those all in today's episode. In fact, Andy Patton, my co-host, was joking around with me that I should just try to get 27 names into today's show in 27 minutes and just see if I could rapid fire that thing like uh, the verses of what is that facet like we didn't start the fire or whatever it is? <laughs> That'd be funny. But we're going to unpack all of that great content over the coming days and weeks. I know next Monday, Andy and I are going to do draft deadline winners and losers, things like that. And so you can be ready for that, especially you everydayers who we know will be ready for it. Well, coming up on today's show, though, I want to hit a couple highlights, including the last two national players of the year who made different decisions about uh, next basketball season, one coming back to school, one not. Uh, so great news for Purdue, not so great news for Kentucky, and kind of a turning point for UConn. I want to touch on the national champions as well. So we'll end the show with that. But first... We got to talk about the dark days in Lexington, Kentucky going on right now. Oscar Shibwe is staying in this draft. I legitimately thought, basically since we entered into the transfer portal window since the end of the season up until now, I really legitimately thought Oscar Shibwe was going to come back one more time. I know it, it might have been unlikely or other things, but I, I really thought it would happen especially once they missed on Hunter Dickinson. I, I was like, man, all right, Shibuya must be coming back. That's going to happen. Here we go. But all along, Oscar Shibuya said to Kentucky, I don't want you to plan on me. I want you to make your decisions. Do what you got to do. If I come back to college, I'll figure it out, whether it's being at Kentucky or elsewhere. But don't wait around for me, right? It's like if, if there was a girl I always wanted to date, and I just waited and waited, hoping she'd break up with her current boyfriend. And she would say, don't wait on me. I don't know what's going to happen. And I just waited and waited and waited. And she ended up marrying the dude. And here I could have been moving on to getting a different girlfriend. But now I missed out on the other pretty girls I wanted. That's kind of the boat Kentucky's in. So this is a massive blow for the Wildcats. Wildcats not getting Sheboy or Hunter Dickinson. And so you... Got to be super, super glad if you're Wildcat Nation that Yugana Onyenso came back after initially entering the transfer portal and then ultimately pulling out to come back to Kansas. That's great news because I don't know what to do if he's gone. Well, unfortunately for Kentucky, the Sheboy news was not the only bad news of the day. Right towards the end of Wednesday and the end of the transfer portal, we learned that Chris Livingston is also going to stay in the draft. We already knew that Cason Wallace was never going to pull out. He's probably a lottery pick, if not just right there, probably in the teens of the first round. And then Jacob Toppin, we have known, is staying in as well. So that's four Kentucky players now who are staying in the draft. The problem for the Wildcats is that it doesn't end there. Like there's some potential good news in the fact that Antonio Reeves did pull out of the draft and is coming back to college, but there's some noise that he might not come back to Kentucky either. I mean, poor coach Cal and his coaching staff, they got to just be like, what, what is happening 
and they have missed things here. So Antonio Reeves coming back, maybe not to Kentucky. And for my money's worth, he was arguably the best player for Kentucky down the stretch last year. Obviously a lot of guys playing well, but he was certainly just right there at the top of that heap. Now for Kentucky with that possibility of losing Antonio Reeves to the transfer portal, let's not forget. Savir Wheeler's off to Washington. Lance Ware transferred out to Villanova. CJ Frederick is gone to Cincinnati. And Damian Collins has gone to LSU. Now, I know with some of those guys, you might look at it and say, good riddance, glad you're gone. And I would get that and I would understand it. But it is more turnover for Kentucky. So the Reeves news, we need to wait to see what's going on there because I think that is big if Kentucky could reel back in Reeves. And again, great news that Yugana Onyenso came back as well. But as it appears right now here on the first day of June, it looks like Kentucky's going to have to once again rely on a bunch of freshmen, which they necessarily haven't been doing lately. They've been really using the transfer portal to bring in a lot of what they have along with their, their high school talent they've brought in. But it's been a mixture. It looks like this year it might be a lot of those high school. Now, albeit, let me say, Kentucky's incoming class is absolutely loaded. They, they've they got the talent coming in, but it's just that age-old question we've been asking with Kentucky and Duke for years now, can the young talent win? We're going to have to find that out, and hopefully, again, Reeves will hopefully come back. But the other question for Kentucky now is, all right, let's look at the pool of players who are still in the transfer portal, either of those who are already in or those who have said, hey, I'm pulling out of the NBA draft and in a also move, I'm being I'm going to utilize already being in the transfer portal. So could Coach Cal go out and get great and transfer Arthur Kaluma? Could he get Grant Nelson? That's that's a player a lot have talked about. Could be a great pickup. I know there's others out there, but that's probably two of the biggest names that I would think about as potential targets for the Wildcats. But here's the thing. I can tell you from talking to our good friend, the host of Locked On Kentucky, Lance Daw. I can tell you from talking to a bunch of my friends who are Kentucky fans, who are part of Big Blue Nation, Kentucky is not going to be patient. There's been a lot of frustration the past couple of years with some of the postseason failures, with some of the up and down during the regular season. Coach Cal got to get this thing figured out, man. I mean, he you can't fire him, lifetime contract. That buyout is just way, 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 way too much money. And I mean, I mean, I'm sure Kentucky boosters could find it and do what they got to do, but still, you hear my point. There's not going to be much patience in Lexington, Kentucky next year. So they're going to have to figure this thing out. Well, while Kentucky did not get back their national player of the year for a second year in a row, Purdue, on the other hand, did get back the reigning national player of the year. And we want to celebrate that with Purdue. And we'll do that in just a second. But first, this episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Hey, make a fast break to FanDuel right now during the NBA Finals, which are just about to start. Because right now, new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. I love betting with FanDuel for my sports stuff because the app, it's safe, secure, super easy to use. There's great promotions literally every day with FanDuel. Not to mention that you can get paid instantly from those winnings. So, there's no better place to bet all the NBA playoff action than America's number one sportsbook. So, why don't you go visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get that no sweat first bet up to $1,000. Once again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Hey, you everydayers, once again, thanks for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen or watch every single day. Coming up tomorrow on the show, uh, we're going to have a lot more transfer uh, transfer portal, <laughs> draft deadline content for, for you. More names, more winners, more losers, more reactions to that. So make sure you tune in. But for right now, we got to get to the team that last season became just the second ever number one seed to lose to a 16 seed in the NCAA tournament. 
Obviously, we know what happened to Virginia the year after they lost to UMBC. They came back and won the national championship. Is it legitimate for Purdue, who is coming off a Big Ten regular season championship and a Big Ten tournament championship, to have that same level of aspiration? Because very similar to Virginia, Purdue is bringing back just about everyone from the team that did everything I just said with the year more worth of experience. So obviously the big name, the big news is that in terms of what we're talking about today is Zach Eady returning to college basketball. This has been my assumption all along. This is why I have continued to rank Purdue where I have. I think there is probably a team that would have grabbed Edie in the second round and just had a nice plug and play guy that can stand up and reach his arms up and it's nine foot seven and a half inches up there. And then you just got to jump three or four inches to dunk the basketball. I think a team would have done that for Zach Edie. But how would you feel as a competitor knowing what just happened to Purdue at the end of last year? after the surprising run that they had had all the rest of the season leading up to that. I know there were some hiccups late in Big Ten play, but whatever. Zach Eady's back, and I think he's back with as much vengeance as Zach Eady can have, uh, just as cool, calm, and collected a customer as he is. But Zach Eady coming back as the second straight national player of the year to come back to college basketball is so great for our sport. I absolutely love it. And so NBA, thank you for not wanting Zach Eady in a big way because we'll take him and we'll love him and nurture him in college basketball and it'll be great. CBS Sports college basketball writer Matt Norlander said on Twitter uh, from 2009 to 2021, So over a decade, every national player of the year left college basketball the next season. But now we've had two in a row. That's awesome. After a stretch of over a decade of every national player of the year leaving from 2009 up through 2021, now we've had two straight come back. Obviously, we just talked about Oscar Shibwe, the 22 national player of the year. And now we get back Zach Eady, the 23 national player of the year. By the way, Here's a trivia question for you. I said it's been 2009 to 2021. So that meant that means by definition, the 2008 player of national player of the year came back to college. My question to you, who was that national player of the year to do so? I'll give you three seconds to either pause it or to just think, and then I'm going to give you the answer. You ready? Three, two, one. The national player of the year in 2008 was none other than Tyler Hansborough from North Carolina. So uh, Tyler Hansborough, Oscar Shibwe, Zach Eady, the last three national players of the year to return to college basketball. Now for Purdue, there's a couple things with Zach Eady coming back. Again, this is great. It was the expectation, but until the reality, uh, reality of it ab- actually happens and we have the news officially, I'm coming back. You just never know what might happen. Right. So now we officially know, and it's great. One of the things that's true of Edie, that was also true of Oscar Shibwe, is that he is an international player. Zach Edie is from Canada, you might or might not know. And that means there are some name, image, and likeness hurdles that Purdue has to climb to allow Zach Edie to be able to benefit from his NIL capability. So there's a certain visa he needs to get. Purdue has to make this happen. I would imagine that that has already been signed off on and has already come to fruition, or Zach Eady would probably not be back in college basketball. That's one of the great things about NIL is it's keeping people in our game. Another thing that I love that Purdue has done is Matt Painter scheduled a game in Canada next season. So the Boilermakers are going to be playing Alabama up in Canada on December 9th, which, by the way, is my wife's birthday. Happy birthday, Maggie, (laughs) in three, no, (laughs) I can't count months, July, August, September, October, November, December, six months. I just said three. Somebody teach me the calendar right now, please. Um, Anyway, or maybe it's just because it's past midnight. I'm chalking it up to that. Anyway, that's awesome. And Zach Eady has talked about like, What a neat thing that is for him to have that opportunity to go back and play in Canada. I love stuff like this. Good on you, Matt Painter. Good on you, Nate Oates, for scheduling this game up in Canada as well. But 
you'd be silly to think that that doesn't matter to Zach Eady to go back with his collegiate team and play at home in front of friends and family. Now, all of that aside, the Zach Eady of it all, we already knew that Purdue is getting back just about everyone else, and then Eady's just the icing on the cake. Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer, that freshman backcourt last year, kind of burst onto the scene unexpectedly and had a really solid freshman year, able to do things to match up with Edie. There was a nice balance there. They complemented each other well. But unfortunately, as we kind of projected throughout the season, at some point there was going to be that freshman wall that both Smith and Lawyer hit, and they did. It, it just got to the point where they were not able to perform at the same level, at the same consistency that they did in the early parts of the 22-23 season. But now we get the sophomore versions of both of these young men. They're going to have pushed each other all offseason. They're going to have worked. They know now the rigors of a college basketball season. They know what they got to do to complement Zach Eady. So that's three-fifths of your starting lineup. Caleb First is back. Mason Gillis is back. Ethan Morton is back. The only player who started a game last year for Purdue that won't be back is Brandon Newman. He's gone. Outside of that, you have back every other player that started a game for Purdue, who once again, let me remind you, was the number one seed in the NCAA tournament. We won't talk about what happened there, but they were. They won the Big Ten regular season, and they won the Big Ten conference tournament. Now, are they going to do that again? I don't know, because Illinois got a lot back. Michigan State got a lot back and is bringing in a phenomenal class, right? Like, the Big Ten is going to be really good yet again. Um but there's no reason to think Purdue can't be right there at the top of it again this season. Look at everything they got back. The entire starting lineup is there. Hungry, hungry Zach Eady and these other guys. Matt Painter's a phenomenal basketball coach. I'm really excited to see what Purdue can do last year. When Andy and I do our next top fives, you got to know Purdue's going to be right there in the mix. I would imagine if I haven't really sat down to chart it out yet. If I was guessing right now, I'll probably have them three behind Kansas and Duke. That's just my gut reaction right now. Well, one other group we want to talk about, we've obviously already hit on both of the most two recent national players of the year. To wrap up today, I want to spend some time talking about the reigning national champions who also lost and won a little bit as we got to the draft deadline. We're going to talk about Dan Hurley's national champion, UConn Huskies, in just a second. All right, UConn. There was a world in which outside of Jordan Hawkins, I could have seen UConn getting just about everyone else back that could come back. Right out of the, right after the season, I wondered if Adama Sinogo might stay. Now, of course, if he had, maybe Donovan Klingon moves on. You don't know. But Adama Sinogo went in the draft, as we have known. He was staying in, and, and he did. The big question mark, because you knew you were losing Jordan Hawkins, who's a probable lottery pick. You knew you were losing Adama Sanogo. Would UConn get back Andre Jackson? That was the big question for me. And we learned that answer on Wednesday that he would not, that he was going to stay in the NBA draft. It is what it is. Um, I, I, I thought Jackson would come back, but I'm also not surprised by this move and uh, of him staying in. I, I think he could sneak into that back end of the first round of the NBA draft. We might also see him in the second round, but he's going to get picked. That's the thing. It's just at this point, you got to think either he's betting on himself or he's got some kind of guarantee from a team. And if you do, can't blame you for sticking with the draft. One other player I think of big consequence that UConn loses is Naheem Aline, who has transferred in conference over to St. John's and Rick Pitino. And so that'll be interesting to see. Um, he was not a starter last year, but just played a pivotal role in when Naheem Aline scored eight or more points. You know, UConn was whatever and whatever record played really well and was a nice piece for them. However, UConn has not been completely depleted as the Kentucky Wildcats that we talked about earlier. The reigning national champions get back Tristan Newton. That's a big deal. When you in college basketball, we talk about it over and over and over again. Guard play matters in such a big way, obviously in March, but throughout the season, somebody, a floor general to control things, to run things. Tristan Newton 
is is so valuable to get back. So we learned that on Wednesday that Tristan Newton was coming back. Similar to Zach Eady, this was the expectation all along is that he would. But once again, until he actually says it and it's fact, you just don't know. So great news for UConn there getting their point guard back. The other thing is that while Donovan Klingon was not a starter next year, last year, excuse me, it's a no-brainer. You plug him in and you just let him go to work. It's kind of similar to what we, going back to Purdue, two seasons ago, we had Zach Eady and Travion Williams. Obviously, Travion Williams left, and then this year it was all Zach Eady, and you saw what happened. Might we get that same kind of leap with Donovan Klingon this year? Perhaps so, because he's going to have a much higher usage rate. He's going to get, I, I legitimately wouldn't be surprised if Dan Hurley is kind of building around him in a big way. But there's something really nice and comforting for a team when you have your point guard and your center figured out, and then you get the guys in the middle um, inside of that. And so I, I would feel really comfortable sleeping at night right now if I'm Danny Hurley because of that. The other thing is you get Alex Caravan back also for his sophomore year. And so while you lose three starters off of last year's team, you get back two of your starters. That would be Tristan Newton and Don, and excuse me, Caravan. And then a guy who essentially could have was starter level last year in Donovan Klingon. So in some ways it feels like you get three of five starters back. And so you start to look at next year's team and you think, okay, what does this mean? Does this become Tristan Newton's team? Does he take like last year? One of the things we talked about a lot with Kansas is if they want to repeat as national champions or compete at a really high level in the big 12 and on the national stage, they're going to have to have Jalen Wilson step up in a major way. So that was last year's reigning national champions. And Jalen Wilson did that for this year's reigning national champions. Who's going to take that same leap? Is it Tristan Newton? Just like going bonkers in the big East this year. Is it Donovan Klingon? Now that he has all that opportunity in front of him, like we just talked about, just going, here we go. It's the Donovan Klingon show. Let's get it. Let's go. Maybe it's the two of them combined together, man. If we could just get a, a wicked pick and roll game going all season long for UConn, whatever it may be, you love to see it. But here's some other things. Let's not forget that UConn has a really nice incoming freshman class headlined by Stefan Castle, who I think slots right into the starting backcourt alongside Tristan Newton. And they can be a dynamic duo in the backcourt that is not to be trifled with in the Big East. So if that's the case, if Ka if Castle, again, the, the highlight, the headliner of this class slides right in at the starting two position, you got four of your five starters figured out already. The question is just who comes in and plays kind of Andre Jackson's role next season. That That's what we'll be looking at and what we got to figure out. One spot up for grabs there in the starting lineup. But here's the thing. Don't cry for UConn. Yes, they're sad that they're missing some guys, but they've got talent to step in and fill in. And then they've got incoming freshmen and they're Danny Hurley is a great coach. Just like I just said with Matt Painter, they're going to figure this thing out. Now here's the thing. Big East is going to be loaded yet again. It's going to be a super fun conference. I hope you're excited about it. I certainly am. I know Andy is as well. And so be ready for all that coming with the big East. All right. So that's just the first three kind of big things I wanted. We wanted to talk about following the draft deadline, looking at two of the national, the most recent national players of the year, making opposite decisions and how it affects their teams. Cause looking at Purdue and Kentucky last year, one's trending up, one is trending down, but it's Kentucky, right? I know they're trending down, but are they going to reload? Who are they going to get? What do the freshmen look like? Great questions. And then UConn seems to be like, maybe take a step back, but we're going to be in really good shape as well. So obviously lots more to come on this. So many teams, so many players to unpack, and we'll do that on tomorrow's show on Friday and then through next week as well. Friends, thanks so much again for making Locked on College Basketball your first listen or watch of the day. If you would, if you love this show, go give us a review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you can leave reviews. If you would, give us five stars. Talk about why you love being part of this show and this community. If you would, go subscribe to our show on YouTube. Help us keep growing it this offseason. Smash the like button and leave your comments on your thoughts on the NBA draft deadline and the guys who stayed in and the guys who pulled out. Also, 
Always got to say it. Apologies to the lawyer family. Go Wildcats. And until tomorrow, peace. Peace.